All right, so today we are continuing on in our study of thermodynamics. I've got a handout for you. If you have your textbook with you, refer, you can go ahead and pull your textbook out because the font in your textbook is a whole lot bigger than the font on this handout that I'm doing. Uh, if you've got your textbook, open it to the indices at the back. It's the same appendices that we used last semester in Chem 1. So I've got a handout version of it. But again, this font here is like size 2. So, unless you've got really, really good eyesight, you might want to just open your textbook. I've also put an electronic version of this on the course website. So if the dog eats yours and you lose your textbook, you've still got some sort of reference. Okay, so just keep that handy today. We're going to talk about the relationship between temperature and spontaneity. Because where we left off on Monday, we said... You know, it's really hard to predict if this reaction is going to be spontaneous because I know that it's temperature dependent, right? And so if I'm giving you a reaction and saying, is this a spontaneous reaction? Well, unless I tell you information about temperature and you understand how to calculate something quantitative, right? It's, it's very difficult to determine if something's spontaneous or not without a temperature component. So let's just review real quickly. What's that little degree sign mean? I get that question all the time. Does that mean temperature? No, right? When you see a little degree sign, that means you're at standard state. And standard state's just a reference point, right? So if we're talking about a gas, that means you're at one atmosphere pressure. If you're dealing with a solution, you're dealing with concentration of one molar, and you're dealing of a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. So that just means under standard conditions, okay? Don't forget that from last semester. <clears throat> so delta H, delta S, delta G values, all in the appendix at the back of your book. Um, this is the handout I just gave you. It's an extremely condensed version of the appendices at the back of your book. And uh, you could also just search it on the internet if you need another copy. Right? That's what I just gave you. Now, let's think back to last semester. I know that was a long time ago. We calculated delta H. What is delta H a measure of? What does that H stand for, by the way? Delta means change in, and what's H? In enthalpy, right. So last semester when we calculated delta H, there were two ways we did it. We did it by using Hess's law, right, where I gave you the elementary steps and you manipulated them. We're not going to do that this semester. This semester we're only going to look at it from um, standard heats of formation, right? So you'll remember this as soon as you see it, I hope. If you've got this generic reaction where these are just the coefficients, and I want delta H, do you remember this from last semester? It's the heat of formation for C times its coefficient plus the heat of formation of D times its coefficient, right? Add those two together, so it's products, what? Minus reactants. Remember, delta always means change in, and delta is always final minus initial. Yes? Final minus initial. So in a chemical reaction, this is the final state, this is the initial state. That's why it's products minus reactants. Okay? And here it is in summation notation, right? The sum of the heats of the formations times their coefficients for the products minus the sum of the heats of formations of the reactants times their coefficients. Do we remember this from last semester? Yes? Don't forget, it's products minus reactants because delta is always change in, which is always calculated as final minus initial. For your reaction, the products are the final state, the reactants are the initial state, okay? So that's why it's products minus reactants. Also, don't forget to make sure your equation is balanced before you do this, right? Because these coefficients play into the uh, calculation, right? So don't forget that as well. Do we remember this from last semester? Or at least can look at it and say, yeah, I've seen that before, right? We did this uh, probably around week 10 of Chem 1. 
All right, so here's an example. Now, all these values are coming from the appendix, right? So if you're looking at this going, where did she get those numbers? Right, those are coming directly from the appendix. So if I've got this reaction, and I say, okay, what's delta H? It's the sum of the heats of the formations of products times their coefficients minus the sum of the heats of the formations of the reactants times their coefficients, right? So, again, this is something I said last semester. Different appendices, if you're looking at a different appendix, some textbooks carry out sig figs ever so slightly. Okay, so for instance, you might see tiny little variations. CO2, 393.5 negative, C. Actually, it's the same on this one. All right. Some textbooks, you might see it rounded to 393.6. Right? So you might see teeny tiny little deviations, but not anything to lose your mind over. Okay? So coefficient of 3 times the heat of formation of CO2 plus coefficient of 4 times the heat of formation of water vapor. Add those two together. Right? Minus coefficient of 1 times the heat of formation of propane. Why is this one zero? Well, if you look it up, it says zero. But a pure element in its most stable form is always going to be zero for the delta H. Not for delta S, but definitely for delta H. But if you don't believe me, you can always just double check it. Right? All these numbers are coming directly from the appendix. I'm not just pulling them out of the air. If you want to know where they're coming from, they're in that handout. So now it's just a little bit of math reduction. right? Reduction, reduction, reduction. We get a negative delta H. We concluded last semester that this was exothermic, right? When delta H is negative, we called it exothermic. And that's true. If you set propane on fire, will it feel warm? Yes, exothermic. So this is actually one of the exact samples problems that I showed you last semester. I literally just copied and pasted it from last semester. And just a reminder that anytime you write a combustion reaction, you need to write H2O as a gas. Right, because when you burn something, do you see a little puddle forming? No, you're making water vapor, right? So just remember, because the heats of formation are state specific, right? H2O gas and H2O liquid have two different heats of formation. And also when we get into delta S today, it's gonna be two different delta S's. So make sure if you're doing a combustion reaction, you're writing H2O as a gas, not as a liquid. Um, so, why don't you try this one? Just to refresh our memory, make sure we still feel good about this. Calculate the change in enthalpy for the single displacement reaction that occurs between aluminum metal and solid iron three oxide. And let's just do this assuming that both products are solids. I'll pause the recording, give you a minute to try this one. Let's see what you came up with. So we're assuming both products are solid here. I got negative 850.5 kilojoules. Did you? All right, now we're gonna calculate delta S. What does S stand for? Entropy, right? We're gonna calculate delta S for the reaction the same way as delta H. Except now we're plugging in delta S data. So if you're looking at your handout, it has delta S data on it. Now one of the things I want to point out, really important, the units of delta H are in kilojoules per mole. Units of delta S are in joules per mole Kelvin. Right? Got the temperature component in there as well. Notice kilojoules, ones and joules. Okay, that's going to be important later on. So just make a note to yourself that those reference tables one is in joules, one is in kilojoules. <clears throat> so here's an example. Calculate delta S for this reaction. We're doing exactly the same procedure, products minus reactants, right? So two times the delta S plus two times the delta S minus two times the delta S plus three times the delta S. Now pure elements in their most stable form for delta H, it's always zero. But it's not zero for delta S. Okay, so you do have to look it up for delta S. You can't just say, oh, it's zero, right? It's always zero in the pure element in its most stable form for delta H, but not delta S. So you will have to look that up. So why don't you try this one? 
Calculate delta S for the reaction that occurs when solid aluminum oxide reacts with hydrogen gas to produce aluminum metal and water vapor. Try this one out. Let's check our work. Do we agree 180.2? And the units here would be joules per Kelvin mole, using the units from our table. Do we agree? Now, if your answer deviates ever so slightly from mine, it's probably because of differences in the reference table. Um, does anyone have anything slightly different? Okay, yeah, so it would depend on the number of sig figs that this reference table that I was using versus yours. Which numbers are different, can you tell? The 28 value. Yeah, some textbooks round differently on those last decimal places, so it might make your final number ever so slightly different. But the good news is on a test, we'll all be using the same reference page, so we'll all come up with the same answers. All right, do one more before we move on to something else. Write a balanced equation for the combustion of ethane, and then calculate the standard entropy change for this reaction. All right, in terms of our comfort level for this, do we feel pretty good? Feel pretty good in using this procedure, products minus reactants, using the standard reference tables? We feel pretty good about that as a whole. Yes, we're gonna be doing it for the rest of the day today. I came up with negative 96. Again, if your answer deviates slightly, again, it's probably just from number of decimal places in your reference table that I gave you versus the reference table I was using when I wrote this. But does your answer agree within small deviations? Do we agree? Yes. Does everyone remember how to write a combustion reaction? Oops, that shouldn't say H2O liquid in it. That should say H2O gas. See, I told you, don't use H2O liquid, and then I wrote H2O liquid. Minus one for me. All right. So here are some general delta H and delta S relationships. General. I say general meaning... It's not going to apply to every situation, but it's a general relationship. If delta S is positive, is that an increase in entropy or a decrease in entropy? Delta S is positive. Does that mean entropy has gone up or gone down? Let's pretend I go to the doctor and my doctor says, your delta mass is positive 0.93 kilograms. Has my mass gone up or gone down? It's gone up, right? So if my delta S is positive, entropy has gone up, right? Is that spontaneous? Yes. Delta H is negative. We would say that that's spontaneous at all temperatures. If you've got positive positive, it'd be spontaneous at high temp. And if you've got negative positive, it would be spontaneous at low temp only if this value is a small negative number. But this gives us a problem here, right? Because how do you define small? How do I define small? How does the person sitting next to you define small, right? Small is a really subjective number, right? Because a small number to me might not be a small number to you. And so when we say how high is high temperature, or how low is low temperature, or how small are we talking if delta S is a small negative number, well, that, that leaves a, the door open to a lot of confusion, right? So we have to quantify this a little bit better than just some general patterns. And so we're going to calculate Gibbs free energy, <clears throat> uppercase G. And so this factors in the temperature dependence quantitatively. It's a really great tool for us when we're studying thermodynamics because now we know exactly the temperature we're looking at and we can make a quantitative yes or no conclusion. So delta G is delta H minus T delta S or delta H is the change in enthalpy. All right, you just calculated that. Calculated it last semester too. 
T is the Kelvin temperature. How do we convert Celsius to Kelvin? Add 273, and then delta S is the change in entropy. And I write here, watch your units, why? Because if you're using your reference page, what does delta H units come out default setting? Kilojoules, what does delta S come out if you use the default setting? Joules, so can I subtract joules from kilojoules? No, so I need to convert everybody to joules or convert everybody to kilojoules, take your pick, right? And notice delta S has the units of joules per mole Kelvin. Well, that Kelvin will go away, right? Because Kelvin over Kelvin will cross out. So it's nice and convenient. So this allows us to look at temperature dependence. Does everybody understand this calculation? And I actually don't think I put this in the slide, now that I'm standing here thinking about it. I'm not sure I even put the slide in here on how to interpret delta G. Did I? Nope, I didn't. Oops. I want my new slide. All right, so. If delta G, that means spontaneous at your temp. All right, so whatever temperature you pick, if you get a negative delta G, that means your reaction is spontaneous at that temperature. Does it mean that it's going to be spontaneous at every temperature? No, it's only spontaneous at the temperature that you plugged into the equation. Okay, so if it's spontaneous at 298 Kelvin, does that guarantee that it's gonna be spontaneous at 350 Kelvin? No, you'd have to calculate it again using that different temperature. Okay, so if delta G is negative, that means you're spontaneous at that temperature, right? Make a note, it is only at that temperature because this is all temperature dependent. And if delta G is positive, this would be non-spontaneous. Again, at your temperature, right? If you get a positive value of delta G, does that mean it's non-spontaneous at every temperature? No, it's only looking at your particular temperature that you plugged into the equation. So please make this note, okay? You can't conclude that it's always spontaneous or that it's always non-spontaneous because the equation delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S is only at one given temperature. Okay, does everyone see why you can't conclude, you cannot conclude, it's always gonna be spontaneous or it's always gonna be non-spontaneous? Because you're only looking at one particular temperature. Does that make sense? Okay, so make sure you have this in your notes. I actually just realized I never put that in the slide. It's kind of important information. Right, so the more negative delta G is, the more product favored the reaction is. So I did have that in there. Now there are two ways to calculate delta G. So obviously you'll need to calculate delta H and delta S from your tables, and then plug into delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. We would use this method if we know temperature. Right, if I give you a specific temperature, this is the way we would do it. What if I don't know the temperature? I'm not, I'm not interested in any specific temperature. Well, if you look at your page, you do see a delta G column, right? There is a delta G column. You can do some of the products minus some of the reactants if, 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 if what? You don't care about temperature. Okay, so if you don't know the temperature, you just want kind of a general yes or no, but we're not looking at any particular temperature specifically, then you can do some of the products minus some of the reactants. But if I say at blah, blah, blah temperature, can you do this method? No, you can't, okay? If I give you a temperature, you gotta plug it in, calculate delta H, some of the products minus some of the reactants, calculate delta S, some of the products minus some of the reactants. Plug it in with your Kelvin temperature. But if I don't give you any particular temperature, then you can just do products minus reactants. 
Does everyone understand when to use which version? Guess which version we're going to be using because we care about the temperature, right? We don't want a generic delta G. We want a specific delta G. So again, one is when we use have temperature. One is we use if we don't have temperature. So why don't you try this one? One of the reactions that forms smog is given right here. You work for the EPA. You've been asked to determine if this process is spontaneous on a warm day. 30 degrees Celsius. That's a hot day. Actually, not a warm day. That's a hot day. So what's delta G at this temperature? And then decide, is this reaction going to be spontaneous at that temperature? I'll pause the recording, give you a few minutes to try this. All right, let's see what everybody got for this one. We have to calculate this the long way, right? Delta H minus T delta S, because I'm given the temperature, so I have to consider, is this spontaneous at that specific temperature? Not just looking at it generically. So I got delta H is negative 198, and delta S is negative 187, but notice, one's in joules, one's in kilojoules. So either convert joules to kilojoules or convert kilojoules to joules, right? Because before you plug into your delta G expression, these two units have to match, otherwise your answer is nonsense. So I converted to kilojoules, that way I get a smaller number, but ultimately it's your choice. And so when I do my arithmetic, I got negative 142 kilojoules. Did you get something in that neighborhood? Again, your answer might vary ever so slightly based on sig figs from your reference table versus mine. But do you get something close, as in within a tenth? Now, if delta G is negative, will this smog be forming spontaneously at this temperature? Yes, right? Delta G is negative, that means that yes, 30 degrees Celsius is a temperature where this can be spontaneous. Okay. Now can we conclude that this reaction is going to occur at 8 degrees Celsius based on this value? No. All right, your calculation in the winter time is going to be different than your calculation in the summertime because you can only consider one temperature at a time. You can only make a conclusion based on that one temperature. All right, here's one more for you to try. What is the Gibbs free energy for the reaction occurring between iron metal and oxygen gas to form iron three oxide, which is a solid, put solid in there, at room temperature? Iron three oxide is affectionately known as rust. So what's Gibbs free energy for forming rust? at room temperature. I'll pause it and let's try this one. Last one. So we're deciding, am I gonna form rust at room temperature? So we first need to write a reaction. Right? And so we need to use the long version. Here's my delta H. Here's my delta S. Do we agree on those values within small variation? Do we agree? So I got delta G of negative 1.49 times 10 to the third kilojoules. Would this be spontaneous? Yes, yes it would, right? You leave a piece of metal iron sitting outside, it's gonna rust. Right? At room temperature, it's going to rust. It's, it's going to rust really good. Any questions on how we do Gibbs free energy calculations? How do we feel about it? Feeling pretty good? Feeling pretty good? No stoichiometry. Woo! So that's where we're going to stop for today. And I will see you tomorrow.